Constantino Mitchell, and he seems to be kind of loosey. He did the marquee on that, you know, that famous marquee you see, which is um, got one of my little homebrew machines. See, I've got that's just a cheap printout. You can get all that artwork online anymore, which is kind of nice. You just go type it in. If you've got Photoshop, you can get the the Photoshop files and send it to your Kinkos or local whatever and they'll print those things. That was probably like 80 cents. Works for me. I know the hardcores out there say you have to have a real marquee like like my Berserk marquee that I just got last week. I'm 46 years old and I still do things like bar Berserk marquees on whim. Well, that's only like 20 bucks. But I really enjoy that game. I, I got curious about that game when I found out that it was the impetus for Robotron. And then I had the pleasure of meeting Joel West and uh, getting to know him. You know, he's, he's one of the great players of all time at that game. And it's kind of got a special spot. I tried to talk to Alan McNeil, the developer, but man, he's really grumpy and reclusive. So there were a couple of emails and that was about it. He didn't really want to be bothered. Um, he knew Eugene and Larry. He told some stories about remembering them, and they've also told some stories. If you go out on the guide, the Robotron guidebook, there's a research section, and some commentary by Le uh, Eugene is out there, like when they met, when they met Alan when he came to Williams. You know, fun fact, I'm just rambling now. I read this in uh, Alan's write-up. He's got a bunch of stuff on a website, even the code for Zerk and Frenzy is out there. He's got old pictures. It's pretty fascinating. It's a hard site to find, but I've got it linked on the on the guide. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, when Atari purchased the rights to Berserk, they paid four million dollars just for the rights to the name Berserk, and they did not even want the code, or they didn't even care to talk to Alan about how he designed the game. So when you play those other versions of Berserk out there like the Atari ports. That was purely some really sharp Atari computer programmer that dissected the enemy dynamics of the game and reconstructed it. Um, Alan had opinions about that, but imagine he's got opinions about a lot of things. He's kind of a character. Somebody showed up online that used to work with him. They mentioned that he was grumpy back then, too. So it's pretty fascinating, you know. It looks like um, Stern getting four million out of Atari for Berserk was probably the main money made on that. Alan doesn't even have a Berserk machine. Larry didn't like Defender. <laughs> you know, I've been trying to learn Defender for two years, and I don't think I like Defender either. It makes me cuss a lot. Well, it took a year to learn Robotron. I still crappy at Root Defender. That's why I wish Gary. Gary's oh. virtual gas. He needs to come on here and, you know, <laughs> talk about the legacy of this stuff. How many J-Rock boards exist? Boy, that's a good question. There's a lot of them out there. Oh, uh, Bill, Data God, did you get a hold of that Berserk board that went up for sale, the J-Rock board? I didn't realize that you wanted to be notified exclusively. I just saw it on the on that uh, collector site. Somebody bought it. Hopefully it was you. Have you used the pinball arcade emulator? Yes. Are you talking about um, the main one that's doing all the, the old games like they're getting ready to do, Adam's Family, which Larry worked on? I, I played, I've got, I actually was buying that for my phone, um, those apps, but I'll be dang the last year, my eyes changed, and now I have to wear reading glasses. The, the optometrist laughed me, said, that always happens to people your age. And it's like, son of a gun, I'm actually old. I have, but I was playing on the iPhone, little iPhone here, and now I can't see the damn thing very well at all, so I don't play it much anymore. Plus, it got expensive buying those games at five bucks a pop, and then you have to rebuy them if you're changing to a different uh, platform. What? And at Pinball Expo, and then even at this last Arcade Expo, a guy named Norm from Pinball Arcade was there demo and stuff, and I've talked to him before, and I, I just kind of lost interest. But I've also played the ones that you can do, like the MAME type, can't remember what they're called. Virtual Pinball? 
Those are pretty flying. So, what do you, a, a Space Invader, what do you think of the pinball arcade emulator? I can tell you that owning Black Knight and playing that, also a pinbot, and then playing it on the pinball arcade, the physics isn't the, aren't the same at all. They say that they have really good physics, and, and I, I don't feel that on games that I've played before. It feels like the ball is kind of light and fast. And some of the shots that on, happen on the real machine don't happen in that. Uh, especially getting up the ramps is a lot easier on that arcade emulator. So I'm still wondering what happened to Dane's... Oh, Dane is up, I see. I'm, I was reading that screen wrong. There's Dane. The people's champion needs his cowboy hat on. What kind of score does he have? That's pretty far away. I can't read it. Forty-three million. That's really a luxury of this tie-dye ROM set. That's pretty cool that this is being debuted. <laughs> Before, when, when he played, it'd be like a little sticky note that said how many times he rolled the 10 million score. But then Larry unmasked that extra digit, so now you can see the full score. And the lives at, what, 230 or something? That's so insane that these guys can play at that level. When I was eating, I, I was thinking of a couple of things that we kind of glossed over, didn't talk about. And now I can't remember what they all were. I guess it's a good sh shout out for the emulation stuff. I had mentioned earlier that the main trade routes that were marketed by the salespeople at these coin-op places, you know, that's where a lot of these games went, the, ma the major locations. Uh, easily buy a machine, you have to drive somewhere like Kansas City or Minneapolis or, you know, the main, the main hubs around this area. So, it's really quite a, um, it's a luxury that these guys here in America that do have like these real Robotron machines that you see these guys playing that are, you know, what, 30, 32, almost 33 years old. That doesn't exist in the rest of the world. And I know there are guys out there that are listening to this right now. You probably haven't seen a real arcade machine. Some of you may be in three decades. And, and so that, that is a new factor as these, this internet's bringing everybody together too, you know. Uh, there are luxuries here in America, and, and sometimes I, we take them for granted with, like with these having these real machines since Chicago was a hub. So the emulation, especially with Robotron, is good now. A guy named Sean Riddle, completely, he's a main, part-time main dev, um, just for fun, because he likes the stuff. Likes digging these old schematics and these old games and doing scientific testing. He rewrote the code and, and you can play a very accurate rendition of emulation. And it's out on Gary Whittingham's Williams Players Unite. You can just download a compiled version that's all ready to go. If you go out and look around on it, you could be playing right now like from keyboard like Darren Cormier was doing earlier. Um, but there's absolutely no reason not to enjoy this old classic arcade game code from emulation. It, it's a lot of fun, and, and I know that's the only avenue that a lot of you guys have out there. Um, I don't know, Tails Pop Potrich out there? Or South American Beast Defender who's getting ready to get close to getting a million? Maybe he already did, I can't remember. Oh, you know what? My messages weren't updating. Here, I'm going to have to scroll down. Okay. 
It's, uh, it's good and getting a chance to play pinball games that I've never seen, but yeah, it's not like the real thing. I'll tell you what blew me away is John Weeks's place out in Banning, California. Um, I went out there with Walter Day and, you know, we met up with Billy, <laughs> Billy Joel, Billy Mitchell and Joel West. Uh, man, John has pinball machines that I have never seen before. And it's pretty amazing. And I, I happened to be walking in the building at one point when Roger Sharp was walking in. He he did a he did a Q and A out there, and he played in the tournament stuff. If you ever seen Roger play? He's got a very unique stance. Uh, you know it's Roger without even seeing him. You can see his legs and know it's Roger. Um, but he said there are some games there that he wasn't aware of. And as far as I know, with living historians connected to Chicago, you would think that he would be the most well-versed at any machine out there uh, knowing about it since he's written books and, you know, guys should work personally with all of those developers, the Steve Cordex and, you know, that whole legion of people when you start doing the research. So if you guys are ever down the Los Angeles way, it's about 95 miles from Los Angeles toward Palm Springs, it's absolutely amazing. It's beside an airport. It's an old airport.